So not that long ago that the Phoenix Suns had gone 11-2 and in their last 13 playoff games. I mean, they were rolling, right? And then they rolled to a 2-0 lead in the finals. So they were 13-2 and in their last 15 playoff games. So we're not even talking about the finals at that point. We're talking about a coronation. The Suns in four chants were echoing throughout the Valley. The Suns in four guy was signing merch. The question most people were asking was, would Milwaukee at least find a way to squeeze out a win? I mean, just get a win for some pride, some dignity before Phoenix runs them out of the gym. I mean, show up. You can't get swept. Not when you are arguably the team to beat. So would they at least extend this thing and at least get a game? And the answer was, is yes. They could win one game. Then they could win another And then another. Next thing you know, they've got a 3-2 lead heading back to Milwaukee. And it's not just that they've done it. It's how they've done it. With some swag. With some authority. I don't have a dog in this fight. I don't care. I don't care who wins. I just don't. But I still get hyped even in this moment listening to that and watching that. And how do you not get hyped? How do you not get hyped when you see a big man recover the way he did and make that play? I mean, hell, when I see that, I get hyped. And when I get hyped, I take my shirt off. So a legendary block. And I didn't think, I didn't think that there would be another play in this series. Hell, in the next year or the next five years, they would come close to that. But then the Bucs come up with another absurd moment late in game five, Saturday night. Milwaukee was up by 10 with three minutes to go. But Phoenix goes on a run. Giannis missed a pair of free throws. With 69 seconds left, they seemed to be unraveling. It looked like they were ripping apart. Still up by one with just over 30 seconds to go, and they had to fire off a shot before the shot clock expired. But that's when the hell breaks loose. Tied series, nearly tied game. Home team has the ball. You've got Drew coming in with the perfect rip of Devin Booker, just ripping it right out of his hands. Then he goes down the floor, but he's looking to spin clock, right? And he's waiting to get fouled. That's the smart play in that moment. The smart play is spin clock, get fouled, get the hell out. But that's not what the Bucks did. Because Giannis, who had already played more than 40 minutes, again, somehow had something left in the tank. The big dog is still out here running the floor, calling for the lob. Which, despite what you may think, was not the best idea. I mean, you think it's easy, but it's not. Not at that point in the game. That's just not the best idea. Like, what if they don't connect? What if Giannis doesn't get up high enough? Well, that was not going to be an issue, obviously. But what if they don't connect? What if the timing is off? What if they give the ball right back to the Suns? Right? What if? I mean, I'm not sure what's more insane. Giannis calling for it? Or Drew actually following through with it. We're talking about him throwing up a lob on the break, up one, on the road, in a tied series with 15 seconds to go. But it worked. It worked. Giannis, after playing 40 minutes on that bad leg, going up and throwing it down. He took off on a leg that they thought had shredded in ACL only a few weeks back. And then he comes down with the biggest dunk in Bucks history. So... Exactly what was the big dog thinking in that moment when he called for that lob, even though Drew holding up would have been the better play? I got to know, what was this guy thinking? Great question. But if you're looking for a great answer, you're not going to get it. He admits he's as confused as the rest of us. There's something about this dude, right? There's something about this dude. I I never thought that I would say this about a two-time MVP. I think that I like listening to him speak more than I like watching him play. I mean, how do you not love this dude in a presser? He's not claiming that he had a plan all along or that he was thinking that he might catch Phoenix off guard or might surprise them or that he wanted to finish. He's admitting, I I don't know. I don't really know what I was doing. I'm as surprised as the rest of you. This guy's just dropping gems at at every single press conference that he shows up at. There was his explanation, of course, about having to leave game four early. Remember? Remember? Not, uh, I had to drain the uh, weasel. Not, uh, not anything. Just a tinkle. And then my man likes to get philosophical with it. How about that philosophical approach about how he responded to the block in game four? Let's talk a little philosophy, big dog. Hey, Socrates, have some. 
I mean, forget being one of the greatest basketball players on the planet. This guy really is one of the great interviews on the planet. And more importantly, one of the great philosophers of all time. This dude's 26, and he's dropping knowledge like that. That's as crazy as that block and that dunk. Concepts that this guy's talking about. Ego, pride, humility, staying in the present. Man, my man Ryan Holiday is taking notes. Are you, Giannis, are you kidding me? Usually it would take you a lifetime to learn and master the types of things that he's just dropping and spitting at the press conference. And this guy's just tossing off that knowledge in an off-day presser during the finals. Man, you would ordinarily pay thousands of dollars to go to a seminar and hear that kind of wisdom. And my man's out here giving it away for free. And yes, he's not the first athlete to talk about the importance of staying in the moment. But normally that comes in the form of cliches. You know, taking it one day at a time, sticking to the process, trust the process. And that's not a shot of Joel. I love Joel, man. Joel's still my guy. I'm just talking about this guy is taking all of that and tying it into ego and pride and going deeper and doing it in the middle of the finals. I repeat, the middle of the finals. The stakes could not be bigger. And my man is just real comfortable. Listen, this is a Bucks team, all right? that have been counting out so many times in these playoffs alone. People were talking about what changes would have to be made to the roster. People were practically running Mike Budenholzer out of town on a rail. Like, this guy was fired before the finals were even over. Some went as far as to say that Giannis wasn't even a superstar. That Giannis was a complimentary star, a supporting star, not even the most important guy on their own team. I mean, how stupid was that take? I mean, how bad does that look right about now? Listen, here's the thing. If you're a betting person and you want value, there is still value in Phoenix. You can go find it right now. Phoenix is in a bad spot, down three games to two. But if you still believe in them and you still trust them and you want value, you could pick them up right now for like plus 315, plus 320. I'm not saying this series is over. Phoenix, well, it should be. Man, they've had opportunities. And if they don't come back, they'll be kicking themselves forever. Except they are tough as hell. I'm not going to write them off yet. They're not going down without throwing a few punches. But the fact that Milwaukee is in the driver's seat is remarkable. And if they finish this off, man, that is one of the all-time great comebacks. I'm not saying they're coming back from down three games to none. But they were down two games to none. And they look dead in the water. They look dead on arrival. Yet here we are. I actually did say that I never thought that I would say this about a two-time MVP, but I like listening to this guy almost as much as I like watching this guy play. I mean, you're right. He's charming. He's really, really charming. Now, about a week ago, the Bucks were down 2-0 in the series. At that point, when they fell behind 2-0, what were you thinking about their chances after the first two games in Phoenix? They were, they were bleak, you know what I mean? I mean, I actually just got reminded uh, today of the history in terms of what the finals, you know, uh, tells us about going down 0-2. So uh, teams that, that did that are 4-31. and 31. Uh, You know, that's percentage-wise, obviously, extremely bleak. And just in terms of the mood, you know, you had Chris Paul dominating game one, Devin Booker finding his way in game two, and, uh, and you know, and, and looking like a squad that – you remember that, that one possession, I think, in game two where, Jim, they, they whipped that ball around, you know, 10, 11 times in one possession, and it just looked like the Bucks didn't have an answer. So – I thought for sure that you know we'd be kind of gearing up to to write, excuse me, write our uh, our championship stories on this sun, but uh, but this thing has certainly turned. Sam Amick is joining us in terms of the turn. Like if we were to circle back, Sam, to that game four block, and I'll do that in a moment. But as you wrote for the Athletic, with 109 left in game five. Giannis had two free throws. Their lead had been cut to three. Then he missed the first one. Then Monty Williams called a timeout before the second one. And then Giannis missed the second one. What did you make of that moment? It was a lot. I've been listen. You you mentioned Giannis and how much you've enjoyed him. I have just been absolutely loving the sports psychology part of this series, and specifically with Giannis. So I mean, that moment to me spoke to composure. um, You know, when and Giannis has talked about this when the outcome and the results don't fall in your favor and not allowing it to change your mentality and change your competitiveness. And that to me, I mean, I hate to keep making this parallel. It's not the most comfortable for the other guy, but I mean, we have seen in these playoffs that Ben Simmons stopped attacking the rim when he got in his head about shooting and about the free throw line and Giannis's ability to just 
you know, when the crowd is counting to 10 extremely loudly, when Monty is icing you, when Jay Crowder is legitimately bumping you as you walk to the free throw line, when Chris Paul, I think, was uh, kind of nudged him on the hip, they were they, clearly in that timeout, they had had conversations about, you know, let's, let's mess with this guy. And so he misses those free throws. But then as we saw soon thereafter, you know, he was still ready for that moment with Drew Holiday. Talking to Sam Amick, and to that moment, Sam, and when you talk about his ability to continue to attack the basket no matter what happens, I mean, how about that? Drew comes up with that steal, and then the lob to Giannis. I mean, obviously, the smart play there is to pull that ball back out, run the offense, spin some right. clock, get fouled. What did you make then of Giannis? And you started to touch on this, but what did you make of Giannis calling for the lob and then his explanation <laughs> of the thought process behind it? I thought it was great. I mean, he, he was the first to admit that, yeah, 13 seconds, 15 seconds, up one, uh, you definitely pull it out. And, and he even said, he's like, you know, we probably throw it to Chris Middleton. He probably gets fouled. He probably hits the free throws. He's like, but we're on the break, and I, and, and I know what I can do. And so he calls for it. Uh, somebody, uh, our, our friend Jay Adande, I saw I tweeted yesterday an image where you can actually see Chris Middleton also pointing to the sky. And, and I don't think Drew saw him. But Chris was hoping that Drew would throw the lob. And they just, you know, they know, obviously, that there's one dude in the NBA who can go get a ball uh, like that, and Giannis is that guy. And, and it was the hammer, right? I mean, that was the, you know, lights out and, and son say goodbye and, and game five. And it was dramatic. And, and I think, honestly, it's the kind of thing that even if the, the Bucks had won and, and played it conventionally, I, I feel like they got more momentum going into game six because of that, and their spirit is incredibly high right now. I think that's a great point right there. Sam Amick is joining us, and I also agree with the point that if there's one guy who can go up and get it, it's that guy. But again, we're talking about a guy who's out there for 40 minutes who's been on a bad leg, a bad stick, right. and he still goes right. up and he gets it. I mean, even if Chris Middleton was pointing to this guy like throw the ball up, still... Sam, what's it say about Drew Holiday, for instance, that he made that play on the steal and he still trusted Giannis with that pass? I mean, Drew Holiday is Drew Holiday. He is a pro's pro, but he still has to throw that ball up. What's that play say about oh, him? Oh, yeah. Well, my favorite, you know, the, the joys of technology, we have the, the NBA's phantom cam where they slow everything down, and it's like, my goodness, you can sit there and watch Drew's brain in motion. You know, it's like he sees Giannis on the break, you know, he, the thought bubble over his head, you know, it might as well be like, seriously, Yana, like we're doing this, you know? <laughs> and, and then eventually he decides to, to go ahead and throw it. it. It speaks to trust. And both guys talk about trust a lot and not to be dramatic, but in terms of the human side of their story, it's like they drew and Giannis have only been together for this season. And, and Giannis wanted to have the bucks go get him in the off season for that trade. And it's obviously paying off now. And, and Giannis told him after the game, you know, he went out of his way to tell Drew, thank you for trusting me. And, you know, that is the kind of stuff that I think championships are made of. 